Hello and welcome to episode 28 of Subplot of Course, a podcast discussing a new science fiction work on the second Tuesday of every month. I'm Stavros and with me is someone who prefers scarcity economics because any alternative would put his skills out of use. Charlie. Say hi, Charlie. I mean, as I said before, that is just true of any job. That's true. Charlie teaches math. (laughs) Uh, Also with me is Vincent, who is looking into the implications of reconstituted dead humans with improved immune systems. Say hi, Vincent. Reconstituted humans sounds a lot like camping backpacking food. I, I'm not sure I'm a big fan of it. It sounds a little bit off. But is it just like military rations or something like that? Yeah, and like an MRE, <laughs> like dry and powdery. And yeah, probably don't want those. Yeah. They're not very tasty. Mm, do you want M&Ms and cashews or people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Is it soiling green? <laughs> uh, Vincent's an epidemiologist. Um, and also with us is John, who has already built a matriarchal brain, but had it destroyed for the sake of humanity. Say hi, John. Hey, you're welcome, humanity. <laughs> well I done. Looks a, I think it looks a lot like the fro that John sometimes wear. That's that's what I imagine. <laughs> John's oh, is John's fro just a giant computer calculating everything in his head? Does he yeah, know yeah, everything? It is. He took all his hair and constructed it into computing power and just floats around his head. <laughs> my, all, all of my hair is computeronium everything (laughs) around me keeps me warm nice Uh, john is a mechanical engineer um and today we're going to be talking about accelerando uh written by charles strauss and published in 2005 uh you should prepare for spoilers and then full disclosure we actually recorded a full episode but then due to a technical negligence on my part it was not usable so we're doing this again Wait, Star Wars, did you say something? I can't hear you. You're gone again. I know. I, we're going to find I out after our I would have called it negligence. <laughs> I, w- I would have called it an innocent mistake, but, you know, it's your show. Hey, just, just this weekend I said there's so much in this book that we could record an entire another episode and never repeat a topic, and I guess we are. Thanks, <laughs> And here we are. Thank me later. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about, let's do some plot synopsis here. Uh, So, this book is separated into three sections. Uh, One before the technological singularity, one as the singularity is occurring, and the final one after the singularity has occurred. And throughout the whole adventure, the story follows Manfred Max and his descendants. Um, In the first section, Manfred, who is a technological genius nomad in the near future, I didn't realize it. It's Man Max. It's like Mad Max. Yeah. Wow. In but you're having all these insights on the second re- you, recording. You did it, Vincent. <laughs> yeah. Give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> anyway, he escapes from his dominatrix wife, Pamela, but not before she's impregnated with their daughter. Uh, Manfred goes on to pioneer several significant pieces of te- technological evolution, including the employment of brain-uploaded lobsters in deep space and the establishment of the legal precedent for non-human intelligences. Uh, the sec- second section follows Manfred's daughter, Amber, who escapes her mother via a mining ship en route to Jupiter, then proceeds to set herself up in her own little empire. From there, she ends up sending uploaded versions of herself and others to investigate a router from an alien civilization, where they end up barely escaping from what the humans estimate are sentient corporations that try and use the humans as currency. They return home with a low opinion of the aliens through the router. It's just space spam. I know, spam. Uh, The final section picks up with Amber's son, Sirhan, who is actually the son of physical Amber, this is where it gets complicated, who was left behind when the digitized Amber went to make contact with the router aliens. Um, in this new post-singularity world, AIs called the Vile Offspring, offspring control the inner solar system, and after reuniting with various members of her family, both living and dead, Amber attempts to get elected in an effort to move humanity out of the solar system, but ends up losing. Uh, luckily, the lobsters from the first part of the novel agree to take on the humans as explorers, and humanity perseveres. Uh, the book wraps up in the far future with humanity hanging out around brown, brown dwarfs in habitats too insignificant to be noticed by the intergalactic AIs. Manfred's pet, pet robot cat Ainiko returns to the humans, revealing that he was a super intelligence from the start, that's the starting point of the novel, and that he manipulated the Max bloodline from the start. He wants to take a copy of Sirhan's son, who is also a Manfred clone for some reason, 
in order to test a potential alien data packet, then kill the copy. The book ends with the result of Aineko's experiment, a mystery. All right, so let's jump into some topics here. So um, the first, first and foremost, and I know this was a, a piece of feedback uh, that came from all, almost all of us, is the, the denseness of the language in the novel. In my opinion, this is one of the, the more negative parts of the book. It, it's, it's just extremely dense and wordy and kind of, I know, Vincent, you were, you were kind of mentioning before, you kind of feel, felt like it was kind of artificially inflating the intelligence of the novel. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so the book, like when Star Wars says it's dense, um, it really just has a ton of verbiage, which is very confusing. Um, like an example is he'll throw out a term like copy lefting as opposed to copywriting. And you'll think, oh, okay, you know, that, that, you know, must mean something, right? But no, he'll go on to say a bunch of other nonsense words, which sound very interesting and technological, and they don't mean anything. So you'll sit there thinking, oh my gosh, he just wrote like an entire paragraph. And if you sit there and analyze the phrasing that he uses in the paragraph, like you think that there's a lot of stuff going on, but none of it's ever explained. So you're kind of left in a lurch. So a lot of the book is actually more like ambiance, like in terms of like the types of words his, words he uses. And it's really frustrating to a careful reader because if you think that he's actually trying to tell you something that you should understand, you probably just wasted five minutes of your time analyzing a sentence, which was never meant to mean anything in the first place. So that's the reason why I really disliked the book at first. But then towards the end, I kind of realized, oh, maybe the part of the reason why he is using such complex language is to highlight how stupid humans are as flesh bags, because the final theme is typically that humans are so stupid, there's no place for us in the solar system. AIs and matrioska brains really own everything, along with economics 2.0, ideas that we can't understand. So why not write the book in a way that's really hard to understand, just to show how stupid humans are? <laughs> just make the reader feel <laughs> stupid. That's how you get a lot of readers, right? So you make them feel yeah. really dumb. Yeah. Well, I also like the idea that so we're getting all these nonsense phrases and that sort of thing, but a large part of the theme of the book is just how fast culture as well as technology is accelerating to the point of where like, you know, people who don't grasp onto the new technology like just get straight up left behind. So a lot of the kind of quote like news reports of what's going on outside of the main plot of the book sounds like nonsense. But I mean, that's kind of how if you read a news report 10 years from now talking about these weird new events and cultures and stuff popping up, it would sound to you now. So it just makes sense that it would just get weirder and more foreign, even if it is just silly combinations of words you recognize now. Interesting. You know, I, I don't know if I would agree with you, Vincent, that the he's purposefully trying to make the reader feel, you know, incompetent, maybe. Um, this is your second chance to obviously. You, sure you don't want to disagree, you want to disagree with me? Come I on. disagree with you again. Oh my god, this too. <laughs> anyway, so I you know, as I as I mentioned last time, um so <laughs> I, I, I of course uh, listened to this book um in audiobook form, um, and I made it about halfway through uh, a second read. And the first time through, the, the kind of nice thing about being in, audio, in, in audiobook form, you can't really get hung up on any particular phrase like I'm sure you guys probably ran into. But I will say that on the second read through where I am getting more and more familiar with all the terms like, you know, Matrix Grocery Brain you mentioned, I mean, all the other kind of crazy terminology and stuff that he uses, it made it more enjoyable. But the fact that it um, it is so bad, uh, you know, I, I, I'm hesitant to use the word bad. It's it's just too dense to really be able to digest easily your first uh, your first read through. And the fact that I was enjoying it more on the second read through, um, it's nice because I got to appreciate it better. But it just makes it it made it rough the first time around. Oh, I also had the audio book. I have to say, and I I only got through it once, and uh, I was totally on your from your perspective. Like it's really difficult to like get through. It's 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 um. There's just such a, a slam of ideas and words, and some of them are com are very you know difficult to really comprehend what exactly he's talking about but you don't really have time to to like dwell on it because if you're listening to <laughs> the audio book not or something like me oh god i dwelled on every <laughs> sentence it was <laughs> it's hitting you it's hitting you again but actually you know what vince i think you're i think you were onto something to some extent i think there's a combination of both of these things happening because not all the not all the crazy words and ideas does he throw at you are completely nonsensical he actually does you know broach a, like lots of economic and social topics which like at first glance don't make any sense at all because they're so much different from what we would expect based on our normal culture but they um but they're not entirely nonsensical but then you know he just throws in a whole bunch of like 
other stuff that like you know, words that he doesn't explain movements and, and just <laughs> slam together yeah. ideas he's pulling like together he concepts he's pulling together he concepts too it's like uh the stuff yeah. that you can actually google in wikipedia and stuff like that mm-hmm. and he doesn't really spend the time to explain them so he's i don't know if he's assuming the reader has is you know has these i guess has the internet and can look things up or, or what? i mean some of yeah. it is very interesting it's like kernels of amazing ideas like matrioska brains and technological singularities which are like really interesting and then he throws in right. random stuff like the faceless ones were campaigning against you know uh against them on the political platform that everyone should have a face it's like th- that's a political platform that's not something <laughs> i can look up on google i don't think that means anything I, like I think that would like actually a... mean something. What are you talking about? That means something. <laughs> like in a digital world, there's no reason to have a face. No, you don't have, have to have a, have a face. As in everyone should have a face, but then like there's some people who somehow were born without faces and they need to have faces. That's a well, they're platform. digital. Yeah. They don't have to. You know, you know, you missed the point of the book. Vince, go back and reread it. We'll record a third time. <laughs> I, I specifically that part was one of the few parts where it seems like simultaneously like oh he's trying to get into this weird future culture that you're not meant to understand yeah. but at that point it almost also felt like satire mm-hmm. I was like, yeah okay it just broached satire is what you're saying essentially agreed i mean just, just <laughs> agreed. that last part but i was i was going to say in terms of things becoming more and more nonsense i like how as you get further and further in it does slowly get to the idea of the computers are so into themselves that you can't even describe it. It's like, yeah, there's economics 2.0. And as a puny human, you will never be like, you would have to give up your humanity to convert yourself into an intelligence that could even bother to interact with it. It's like, okay, <laughs> that's where it starts getting a little more interesting. Was it Google that like built two computers and they're like, learn to talk to each other, but they forgot to say in English and they realized after like 12 hours they had developed some like hyper efficient computer language. And they're like, nope, unplug them before they like connected it to the internet or anything like that. They're just like, delete. <laughs> yeah, probably for the best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is just that. Except yeah. if they weren't stupid enough to unplug it, they just uploaded it into the internet. <laughs> so let's actually talk a little bit more about that. So let so in the, the let's talk about the plausibility of this future. Um, so here, uh, basically, singularities, uh, which this book handles uh, deals with a lot, is basically when uh, you know it's it's just this unforeseen exponential uh, increasing speed of development of technology, basically to the point where you know, human comprehension of the advancement is just becomes impossible or very difficult. Um, and one of the ways that it can manifest is through AIs. Um, and most of the AIs don't show up until later in the book, the vile offspring. So taking that into account, like a lot of this book just deals with the crossing the bridge between like the near future where Manfred is, uh, is, you know, this technological savant into the post singularity timeframe. Did you guys buy this as, a plausible way in which the singularity occurs and and all that kind of stuff the match grocery brain development the whole journey was it plausible I that's think... too big of a question do you buy into the entire every thing of the book <laughs> <That> says <laughs> what i feel like your brain is just like you're looking you're like how does this work as you're you know your profession's i think to play. everyone every human being has already bought into this idea the moment that we embrace the uh, the movie franchise of terminator and the idea of skynet we embrace the idea of technological singularity. The moment we all enjoyed the Matrix movie and robots turn us all into like living human batteries, that's like another version of a technological singularity. I think all of us have believed that AI is inherently potentially the point at which humans go out of control and then we lose control of our planet. Um, this com- book just provides a completely different alternate ver- um, future with aliens, which I think in some ways we can kind of get behind the idea of a technological singularity, but like having weird ass aliens out there, which are like slugs and like, you know, <laughs> trying to con-, con men out in space. I don't know if I buy that. Okay. I actually thought this, this book took a different tact. I, in answer to your question, I believe may, I'll go and say entirely plausible, but with, a, with caveats, because I don't think that everything he described was, was necessarily plausible. But I think over, overall, his idea is plausible. That we would, we have examples in nature of, and it was even mentioned, referenced in the book, of like, the, of, of relative intelligences becoming incomprehensible. Like, it would be like us trying to describe uh, market economics to, to earthworms or something. You know, that the, mm-hmm. the thought that there might be a brain 
much, much smarter than us, or some type of intelligence much smarter than us, not be able, we wouldn't be able to understand it, possibly. It, it would be, we would, and there's other references to this. In fact, Charlie could probably men, uh, mention it. Like, humans are actually pretty bad at at extending our own knowledge beyond experiences with which with which are on our scale like we're pretty happy with physics most people are pretty happy with physics for like relatively slow speeds relatively medium you know sized things that are our size that are you know about uh, that happen during time periods with which we can pretty much understand things that happen very fast or very fast time wise or very fast speed wise or very small or very big we don't understand we really don't understand those things very well mm. yep yeah i think you're totally right there in terms of people not understanding things they should i teach high school math so <laughs> i feel like you have a personal stake in this somehow <laughs> uh, i'm just kidding so something i actually picked out um there, there. So, as far as the extreme end of the, like, kind of the technological state at the end of the novel, that kind of pushed the limits for me. Um, but what I did uh, like a lot about this is just because of the journey through, uh, starting with Manfred right at the start, um, and especially to about midway through where she, where they're kind of going through the, you know, they they have uploaded people and they're going through the router and that kind of thing. Um, there, there, there are a few parts in the novel, especially. Um, you know, there's this this segment in the novel where Manfred loses his glasses, um, and he just complete just becomes completely disoriented because, you know, as we mentioned last time, he just didn't password protect his glasses for some reason. But uh, <laughs> it, it basically like he he just loses like he can't remember stuff, he can't accomplish anything. And if you guys have ever left your phone at home, especially if you're a you know partial phone smartphone addict like me, like you feel like kind of like there's like there are components of your life that you like can no longer access because you don't have your phone with you. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is like a reasonable progression of that. So that kind of made me really buy into it a lot. Yeah, Did you guys have like, some experience? I think I said this last time where there's like a not a concern, but there's like plenty of research about how we memorize and learn less and less stuff as our technology gets better. It's like, how many phone numbers do you know besides your own? Whereas, you know, even when we were kids, like how many of your friends' numbers did you either have memorized or like written down someplace and had to go refer to it? Like when was the last time you looked at a single phone number? Like how many of you yeah. could even say what your wife's phone number is? <laughs> I can... That's because we had to, we, we got married before uh, smartphones almost. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, no, I totally entirely true. Yeah, totally. Yeah, but previously, for instance, again, another reference to to dating all of us in our ages here. I, we <laughs> we would have grown up in a time when Google Maps was not available, or whatever map service you might prescribe to. Like you would have needed to get out an actual map, or actually, to be perfectly honest, they've done studies on this. Like you would have had to have a mental map in your brain about where things were. Turn and off the McDonald's. That's how you get to my yeah, house. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But that's no longer that necessary. Marks. And now with, with reliance on, on mapping services and so forth, it's entirely plausible that if you, uh, when I lose, lose my device or if I don't have it with me and I'm going out someplace, I have to be very careful. I know where I'm going because I may <laughs> not have, have any idea how to get there. Yeah. Even it might be a place that I've, I've been by a couple times. <laughs> I, I will say that... Uh, that whole segment that you brought up was interesting and it was very relevant to Manfred. But I remember like having major gripes with that whole section of the book because he doesn't just lose his glasses, he gets pickpocketed. So some random punk off the street he runs gets by mugged, him, right? Like grabs, she, yeah, he gets he mugged, punches him grabs his stuff and <laughs> runs off. Right. And what really bothered me about this about that scene was that the guy proceeds to put on the glasses and right. there's no password protection. There's no protection <laughs> at all. Like even, even smartphones nowadays have protection, much less <laughs> all the complicated computer algorithms and encryption that they have in the future. But the guy puts on the glasses and the glasses tell him, hi, you must be Manfred. Why don't you go to this meeting? And here's exactly what you're supposed to say if you were yes, Manfred in order to make true. the yeah. complex I, I deal you. happen. And the guy's like, oh, okay, I'll do it. And I was like, what in the <laughs> world is yeah. going on here? This is so <laughs> No, I argued with you about this last time. The point, and that's the one reason I actually really like that chapter. The point is they had gotten to the point where so much of your consciousness and intellect is stored in the computer that swapping out just your sad meat brain makes you more the glasses than whoever's meat brain it's connected to. Like that's but the fact the that there's that no password protection yeah. is no, ridiculous. That's, no, that's the 
<laughs> He's like one of those people that, that they don't put their they don't put a password on their smartphones. So you just open it up. You've got no. their Facebook. You He's, got their no, email. The the point, genius of you guys are missing it. Charlie's point. point. The point <laughs> is the glasses at that point is Manfred. It doesn't need the password protection because it's more him than he is at that point. There's no sense in password protecting the the silly meat brain that's attached because it's such a it's such a small part of whatever him is. Is that the point you're trying to make, Charlie? I yes, assume. Yes, exactly. Like that's but why that chapter is right. right. That's actually where the book started being interesting for me because the first half is just like, oh look, I can up the lobsters and do all these fun economic things. No, but the, the the way the reason why that didn't make sense to me is because after he realizes who he is again, like after he's like, oh my god, I must have gotten robbed. He then has to go through a bunch of password protected online servers in order to get a bunch of his memories back. <laughs> Because he backed himself up <laughs> on the internet. So yes. he obviously had passports. So he had to biometrically test a bunch of shit. Like he had to go through all, like a whole sort of hoopla. Like it's basically like two factor authentication when you lose your phone. Like you're in deep shit. Like somehow you have to get around that. He had to do all that stuff and got his memories back. So he obviously knew that protecting his genius brain, which put out like a billion ideas, which everyone was trying to steal from him, was important. But when someone takes his glasses, oh fuck, you just got all of him. Like for free. Well, the problem is you didn't you didn't get all of him. There's now just another him out there running on someone else's sad brain that can't stand up to the glasses. So like, and that's what we get to later in the book where people actually run their own consciousnesses in parallel and go through various like experiences all at once, and stuff like that. Like yeah. I thought it was a really good split. You know, they later call it forking. And I thought yeah. that was like a really good example of the start of that kind of concept. And when the book gets like really interesting later on, I will say the that example it, it, of oh god, John, this might be critical infrastructure in the United States, right? Where like let's say like there's a power plant or something, and like there's like a lot of cybersecurity to make sure that foreign governments can't can't knock it out. But then they really just have like a normal chain link fence and a lock, you know, just a really something you could drill out at the at the plant. And the reason why is because you know maybe maybe physical crime is not that common. Really, there's not that much incentive to go ahead and, and protect against the glasses being stolen physically because that's so rare. But the opportunity to like hack into it is so high that he would need to have lots of security barriers technologically from from a from a to, to get back in. I guess during in his digital back you know back door, but not you know the physical glasses being taken off his face is probably like inconceivable. Maybe, maybe that's the uh, the argument here. I'm giving the author a lot of a lot of leverage on this, <laughs> I think. I will say that I, I don't think it's I mean there is that I think that that Vincent definitely has a valid point, but I think that that anecdote is more to show the link between the two stages instead of like being actual it's more of like a concept thing instead of like a you know an actual you know this could actually happen type thing. And he, you know for for the benefits and detriments that that ha that that uh, provides but anyway, so that's as far as I mean that that I mean it's essentially talking about the plausibility of the future. That kind of sold me on that. Um, that in, in the same line where the in the same line in the same section of the book um, where Manfred goes like, man, you know my I'm thirty and we're all over thirty, so we're old compared to Manfred apparently. But anyway, so he goes like we're thirty, or I'm thirty. Uh, who goes around with like a thirty year old computer? And I was like, "Oh shit, that's right. I'm I'm like running outdated hardware here. I got I need an upgrade." <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, it's not like the new compute, the new meat computers coming out have been upgraded over the past thirty years. Star was like, in fact, you are running the computer that developed over like however many billion years. Like that's you're true. running. But I need to store my brain on my smartphone now I, for my for my Google Map directions and whatever. There's no room in my oh, meat yeah. brain for that. Oh my gosh, we're running three. Is that what you're saying? We're in three million year old brains? Is that what you're saying? No, you're running like the computer's really old. <laughs> you know, whatever Moore's law is for meat, we're running the three billion year old version of like three billions into the biological digital age into that. Or <laughs> Moore's, Moore's law would be really slow for meat. I'm just going to say that right now. Our computing well, capacity exactly. does not double every two years or something <laughs> exactly that's what i'm explaining to Stavros. like you don't need to worry about that in fact the fact we're not letting people die due to natural selection means you're probably ahead of the curve in terms of the decay of intelligence <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay well so let's move on um 
I, let, let's talk a little bit about the ending. Um, so, uh, you know, the the cat Ainiko, which was not a cat, uh, was a robot. But um, we, we learned basically at the end of the novel that Ainiko is, uh, was basically, it's implied from even before the start of the novel that Ainiko was, uh, it's, it's an upgraded robot cat um, that uh, Manfred and Pamela upgraded, um, basically achieved super intelligence before he even started the novel. Um, so, uh, you know, at the end, it's revealed that Ainiko, uh, you know, has manipulated all of the characters in the novel um, to get to this ending point of being able to use this Manfred clone to try and uh, interpret this alien data packet. Um, so this, it, it was, it was a really, it was kind of eye-opening for me. You know, throughout the novel, uh, you know, Ma uh, Manfred's ex-wife Pamela, um, I did not like her at all um, on the first way through. Um, she's, uh, you know, Manfred and Pamela have this dom sub relationship, and maybe it's just because you know I'm not part of that that community or whatever. I just instantly didn't like her, and she basically rapes him during one scene so she can have a daughter. Um, it's basically she's basically unlo very unlikable the first time, but then we get to the end, and where Ainiko reveals all that. And it, it made me think, I was like, wow, that completely changed my my expectations. And especially listening to it through, um, I made it halfway through, like I mentioned, the second time, you can piece together, you can pick specific instances where Manfred is either like, oh, I was so happy in that relationship. So there's like just something invisible bringing us apart. Or even when Pamela even visits Manfred in the first part of the novel, they like have this great time together, essentially. Um, but there's like this invisible force that's kind of bringing them apart. And that kind of blew my mind. And I felt like there's just preconceptions against you know, this level of Dom that just made me dislike her from the start. But how did you guys handle this? What did you guys think? So I think I mentioned this before, but the, the idea that a computer, however smart it is, take even the smartest human being you could fathom who has the best EQ possible. That's a completely separate topic, like how a computer would have a better EQ enough to manipulate you. Could do you think, Stavros, or any of you, that someone could convince you to rape the person you love? And specifically rape them with the idea that you want their child so you can use it to economically blackmail them. I mean, that is a stretch for me. Like, like the people that we love, to the idea that someone can manipulate me, my current my current self, into raping my own wife so that I could blackmail her for money, it's a very, very hard concept to sell to me. And that's part of the reason why I was like, the whole idea of an AI manipulating human relationships is one thing, but to be able to twist people to that extent seems a little bit far-fetched. And it makes me think that the characters themselves must have had some sort of really messed up situation with their psyche where they were actually willing to, like a small part of them actually would have raped them for money, um, which is the only way I can conceive of this as being partially possible. Yeah, I will say that the economic blackmail came after they divorced, essentially, right? Yeah, I, so I, I think that everything up to the end of chapter one is basically consensual, but then it's implied that somehow he manipulated them to actually divorce because Manfred was too settled in being like dominated right. in their weird. Yeah, he if was, he was if he was content, he's not like, innovating, right? It's implied that that's what he wants, but like the cat purposely breaks him up from Pam because it's a little too perfect, and he's not as creative. But it was quite clear that they never had actual biological intercourse ever in their in their S and M situations. Right. Like they always either like oh, yeah. got each other off manually, but there was never any penetration and or actual sexual intercourse according to well, Bill Clinton. Says that's because like the sexual culture of the day is like exactly hey, whatever you want, but don't trade juicy germs. Ew. But it was very clear that the when the woman rate when when she raped Manfred, she was like, "I'm taking the sperm. We're going to have a baby," and she froze the embryo that got like impregnated it was not like a hey we're gonna yeah. have some interesting different sex it's more like i'm going to have your baby even though you don't want me to and we never agreed to having this type of this type of sex it's my baby now and the entire time she was like you got to pay taxes you got to like make some money and like you know pay on all those inventions you had it was very twisted gotta pay and i don't believe the ai can that. <laughs> I don't know. We don't know exactly what the capabilities of the AI was, even from the start of the novel. We just know that they're it's manipulating them essentially. Yeah. The one thing I kind of like is it's the super AI, but I'm not sure if this was implied or if it's just me reading into it. But the reason it doesn't like go hang out with the other super AIs in the Matryoshka brain and participate in economics 2.0 is because it somewhat has the antisocial behavior of a cat from the start. So that's why it just wants to. <laughs> 
screw <laughs> off and do its own thing. Yeah, I'm not sure. I feel like the author may or may not be in a difficult relationship with the cat at the moment, and then he wrote this <sighs> book about that. I'm just Aww. not sure. <laughs> so, if we're talking about the end of the book, I said this last time, I think the whole, like, and I manipulated your relationships all along was lame. <laughs> that's that's basically like, what cats are like. It was cool enough with him just kind of being along and kind of prodding the characters. So, They're like, I thought that was already, like, pretty clear from the book. So, to have the, like, kind of villain reveal at the very end, when you're so far into the novel that like so far into the future and technology i'm like why does anyone even care anymore like he's just this weird ai cat and why is he why does he even bother revealing this besides just to make them all like pseudo sad and then they're like we are free of him i'm like free of what (laughs) exactly they didn't even know they were they were chained up by him until the end of the novel and now they're finally free of him charlie (laughs) <laughs> i could tell you're really into it <laughs> this 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 topic might be a little bit a little bit um relevant to today's today's society you know society that's going on right now because you know for instance there was this you know intrusion into our election system with if you believe it uh to be to be so where you know the russian government was uh, was using essentially lies and propaganda through our social media platforms to to potentially sway public opinion or divide us or make us lose faith or trust in democracy or, or whatnot. Any, right. any of those things might be might be true. Mm-hmm. And there's a real discussion probably going on right now as to whether or not you know there's there's a lot of people who think that doesn't matter. Because I voted the way that I wanted to vote. Nobody changed my vote. There weren't any actual, you know, ballots being changed. This is changing people's opinions. And people are very there's a there's a contingent of people, and I'm not taking sides necessarily in this discussion, but there's a group of people you can't change my opinion. I'm not that suggestible. Psychology can't can't influence me in that way. And then there's another group of people who think this is very serious who who through psychological methods and propaganda and misinformation can be affected and their votes their votes and how they may feel about these things could be affected and i think that this is a sort of a topic similar to if if there were an intelligent brain or there were an intelligence that were smart enough to understand human psychology could we be suggestible enough to or in any can you know can are we suggestible enough to be to be influenced and how influenced I, and yeah, I and according to this author, very influenceable. <laughs> <laughs> very, very influenceable. Yeah, the cat was the cat was able to completely orchestrate their relationship. Yeah, but the you know what they did? He gave hints to the the cat's intelligence throughout. Yes. Like the the cat was sort of like, oh, you know, I'm sending messages and I'm hanging out and I've got ideas and now I'm intelligence. But then later on, suddenly he's like running the entire human colony. Yeah, he's the <laughs> right. administrator, and I'm like, oh my gosh, why did the cat? <laughs> no one seems to care really. <laughs> just like yeah the cat runs stuff it's fine <laughs> oh, the best part about the cat is its name's Ainako which I think is Japanese for like love cat so he just loves cat but also the eye is just AI so he is just AI cat I'm like well that's <laughs> what? great what? <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah definitely definitely a little crazy there okay well so let's uh, let's move on to our to our improv segment uh, so we're going to have a little bit of a contest uh, we're going to go through each of us and say, so as you guys re- as you guys recall, the first animals to be uploaded into uh, digital space or the, the interwebs um, are the California spine lo- spiny lobster. Um, and of course, they end up coming back and, and doing a great job in saving humanity from the vile offspring. But my question to you is, all things being equal, what would have been a better animal to be uploaded and then sent off into space? to do whatever it is that they were doing, working that mining colony, and then become awesome and save humanity later. What animal would have been best uh, best there? Uh, I'm going to go first. Uh, So I think obviously cat is not the right answer. (laughs) Just putting that out there. If any of you are going to say cat, that is not correct. Wait, but they even bring that up in the book where they're like, we're going to guide our missiles by programming the AI with the cat. and. Target as a laser sight that it's like meow, as it guides the missile to it. It just doesn't know that it's a missile and not a cat. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so I'm not going with cat. I I will, however, you know, I you know, I have a dog, and you know what? 
dogs are pretty loyal. I feel I feel like dogs, you know, you'd be more loyal than lobsters, potentially more trainable. And there's more of a history there. And I think that would be retained if you uploaded a dog into the internet and they would have to come back thousands of years or whatever it is, hundreds of years later in order to save us. I feel like dogs would follow through with that. And, you know, I, I feel like they're, they're just a little bit better off than lobsters in general. They're, they're, they're more complex. They're more trainable off the bat in, in their meat space form. I feel like in the long run, they would probably work out a little bit better than lobsters. So I'm going with dog. Uh, who has another suggestion? Wait, I'm not entirely convinced that this whole, like, copy the electrical everything of a lobster and load it into a computer gets you lobster.exe. Like, imagine <laughs> if you were you, but you had literally no physical anything. You were just in a computer. Like, what is that even? <laughs> That's uploaded internet space, man. According to this, according to this book, it's like being in the Matrix. In chapter five, they just like drink and have sex the whole time until they get to anywhere. Like, why are they running the people simulations while they're flying <laughs> through space? Like, why don't you just put them on pause and then you unpause it and you're like, oh, we're here. <laughs> Great question. It, it's it's like every time on, you're on a flight, like you wish you could fall asleep and just wake up there. Like you have the option. The computer could just turn you <laughs> off for a moment. Or, like, why? <laughs> so do you have a better suggestion? than dogs why what why squirrels i don't they seem to get along fine i don't know why <laughs> did you not listen to anything i just said does it matter nothing matters <laughs> vote squirrels is charlie okay <laughs> <laughs> i don't think so but his suggestion is squirrels so i we're going with that apparently what about between you guys vincent and, vincent and john what do, what do you want to want to pitch well i would pitch something like I, I, if I remember correctly, the the point of this was to like learn something about you know they were uploading these this brain so they could understand something about this this entity and in, in when it gets translated into uh, a digital en ent entity. Right. And I think that starting with a lobster seems like <laughs> ambitious. That seems like a pretty complicated <laughs> brain to start this, and it obviously was because it gained consciousness and then wanted asylum. So that seems. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> So I will say I will say the logical sadness. answer, <laughs> which is that you should start with like an earthworm or something, something that has like a hundred neurons or something. Yeah, for, for real, I was something very that. dumb. No, no, there's a lot of precedent for John's choice because I'm pretty sure that whatever probe you send out will land on the planet of spice in Arrakis. And turn <laughs> a giant land and then we'll begin getting addicted to the spice. Okay. The spice. <laughs> I mean, Yes. As long as we get spice and scrodes, like I am okay with whatever future that is. <laughs> Dune reference. Dune. <laughs> okay, so we got earthworm from John. <laughs> All right, Vincent, what's your so what's unlike, your pick? Unlike Charlie, I had a lot of good ideas on this one. <laughs> <laughs> wow, just going straight, hey, straight I'm, for the throat. I'm not going to disagree with that. Charlie. Fully <laughs> disclosed that he did not even think about his choice. <laughs> um, so one. If you're a massive Orion 2 fan, you got to go with the Space Amoeba because those things defend mm -hmm. galaxies and you got to fight them in order to get the Gaia planets. Okay. But that was not my final choice. Okay. The second choice I had was actually along with your Star Wars because I thought if you want to save humanity, you got to send out a dog because a dog will go and play fetch. It'll go out, it'll go find <laughs> a new a, a planet, a nice shiny little planet, and yes. then ball and be like, come back and get their loyal ma master to bring back to that planet. Yes. It makes sense to me. Uh -huh. But that wasn't my final choice. Okay. Our final choice was actually inspired by probably the most successful alien that humans have ever encountered, which is the aliens from Alien and Alien vs. Predator. Like <laughs> okay. If you look at those aliens, what creature reminds you most of those creatures? A cockroach. Cockroach is like fucking unkillable. We'll live in all sorts of random ass like environments, radiation, whatever it is. And I'm pretty sure if you give it about a millennium, it'll evolve into something that looks like an alien alien. Um so I would say if you send a cockroach out into space, it'll probably breed like crazy, come back, and actually be relatively intelligent and basically unkillable. Space is a dangerous place. You got to send something that'll survive. That's true. So with the, so with the roach. Okay. 
I mean, wasn't the point of this topic to digitize the animal's <laughs> brain so it would make yeah. no difference what biological oh, yeah, defenses no, they have? They're, they're super, they're super tough. They would also create flesh meat bags just like what they did in this book. <laughs> and they'd have digital cockroaches that create real Oh my god, they just, they just fork did, themselves over and over. For the first half of the book, all of the, I was going to kill myself with all the portmanteaus where it's like the meat space and the herd news and I was just like, <laughs> oh my god! Charlie, you just making like, up for your horrible, horrible upload, animal upload suggestion right yeah, now? Yeah, squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even care. <laughs> Anyways. So so let's, like, by the put... time we got to, like, forking and, like, the way more interesting stuff, I was like, okay, like, this is actually pretty cool. But for the first <laughs> half where he's just like, yeah, man, like, we're way past, like, scarcity economics, you know, and your meat space, and look at me looking at my Google Glass, this is so 2012. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, please stop. Charlie's having a hard time. With this yeah, photo. this is the future where like Google Glass actually mattered for more than two <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's vote on these suggestions here. So I went with the obvious best choice, the loyal dog. Uh, we got the simplistic, uh, easier upload with uh, the earthworm from John. Uh, then we the got final choice, which was the cockroach. Oh, no. I don't remember another option, was it? I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, there was some kind of option there. Charlie's option. I think option. it was squirrel. Right. squirrel. I think it was squirrel because. Squirrel. Because why not, apparently? I mean, because, like, you grow your fruit, and then they eat it before it's even ripe, and then everyone's angry. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to name a type of squirrel? Do you want to get a little more specific? Give us something. Whichever Give us a one bone. is native to your neighborhood, because that's just even more infuriating. The, the angsty <laughs> education uh, squirrel. <laughs> yeah, how about the black-haired, squ- the black-haired squirrels or blackbird squirrels of Kent? Kent like State has like Bob squirrels with like the white tails. Those are cute though. I want like ugly squirrels just to make everyone upset because <laughs> the crack squirrels. The ups, dumpster squirrels. Why are we giving computers animalistic personalities? Why would we do this? <laughs> <laughs> so let's vote. Uh, I'm going to go with you know I would say I mean obviously squirrels horrible. Um, I would say I would say with Vincent I, I like that, uh, but I feel like I'm not sure if the cockroaches would get our backs later. I feel like with Earthworm, there's like enough question mark there, like it could go either way. So of all the choices, I'm gonna have to go with uh, with Earthworm. So how about you, John? What's your pick here? You cannot select your own. Oh, I I also think that squirrels are horrible, so I'm not gonna <laughs> choose squirrels. <laughs> And I think that I think your 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 explanation is pretty pretty good. I think both the, the dog makes sense as an upload. It already likes humanity. It wants to serve us and please us. We good get along well. I think right. the dog would be a great thing to upload. Okay, got to vote for vote for me. How about you, Charlie? You I have mean, some good like, choices. Imagine to when you leave the house and your dog is sad. You are just damning that dog intelligence to that for eternity. <laughs> oh, Unless you God. also upload like people intelligence which is the whole point of starting with it anyway but uh i'm gonna have to go with from an engineering standpoint we should start with something simple like the earthworm one makes the most sense to me okay john's in the lead how about you vincent what's your choice here oh this this makes it easy for me uh, because um i (laughs) i love creating conflict and my second idea was a dog so i'm gonna have to go for the perfect tie i'm gonna vote for (laughs) dollars and the perfect dog all right wow tiebreaker I know Blassie, we need, we need a well. tiebreaker. I guess we'll need. No, Blassie, I'm stuck in a gravity well. Go get help. Go get help. Go get help. <laughs> and like your dog shaped <laughs> spaceship. Yeah, and then it would just take a dump in the corner of your room and like crawl on its tummy and look sad, and you'd be like, damn it. <laughs> well, you know what? I guess we're just going to have to ask people to comment with the actual winner because we are not good at picking winners here on this show, apparently. We're all losers, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we just have two winners and two losers. That's how this worked. So, uh, <laughs> can't, oh, oh, oh. can't trust the can't trust the cockroaches. <laughs> the All right, for the win. Yes. Exactly. So let's get into our our wrap up segment here. The thing, the best thing of the book, and the worst thing of the book. Things you liked, things you didn't like. Um, I will go first. Um, best thing. Um, I really enjoyed the transition in this book between kind of near future scenario uh, with the smartphones and the smart glasses all the way up through uh, the post uh, singularity super sci fi opera space type stuff. Uh, really super cool. It, as I said before, the uh, the part where Manfred loses his glasses just makes the super great parallel for me. I was like, oh man, I'm totally buying this now. Um, even with the evil space cat um, at the end, 
I thought the, the twist was really good. It made me rethink stuff. So all of that I really enjoyed a lot. It was really great. Uh, the worst thing, um, the denseness of the language, as I mentioned right off the bat, uh, really hurt my enjoyment. It was, just, it was just kind of really just too bad. I, I, I wish it was easier to digest the first time around. Um, like I said, the, first, the second time that I made uh, what I could make it through helped helped a lot. I understood more what was happening, but um, it just it just really hurt the first time through. So it's so a little, little good, a little bad. Uh, let's go to Vincent. What do you think? Best thing, worst thing? So I think the best thing about the book, um, well, the series of books, because it was actually like a bunch of short novels that were published, which partially confused me because when I was reading it and I, I thought it was one book, it was actually like nine separate novellas, which is why it was so disjointed and why I had a hard time following it. But the best part of it was how adventurous um, Strauss was with his ideas. I love a book where I learn something new or, or something about sci-fi I didn't know before. So the idea of a matrioska brain, which is like you just turn planets into like you just turn them into their basic elements build computers out of them and then make a huge ai and like make entire solar system essentially a cpu of a computer the idea of matrioska brain was something i didn't know about before and i thought was really interesting some of the other ideas he came up with which was like when we're all digitized and we can clone ourselves and fork ourselves into infinite copies what does that do to democracy how does how do votes matter how does property matter does do you own your property or does your clone open, own your property it's like a very interesting concept where i don't think a lot of authors have kind of delved into it at least i haven't read it before so i yeah. really like the diversity of ideas yeah that was good um like what you said Saros, probably the most damning thing for this book was just how hard it was to read that being said it is a free book he like published it online mm. um it made it completely free for whoever wants to read it. So I highly encourage you to read it just because it has a lot of interesting ideas. Um, but I think that this book is kind of a personality test for sci-fi readers. You either like the book and it kind of c- categorizes you into the group of people who can suspend their disbelief and or not focus on writing styles and just focus on ideas, um, which I'm kind of not in that in that category. Or you are kind of more of an anal reader where things have to make sense and send it, and words are there for a reason. And when you throw nonsense words in, the, in there, it pisses you off because it takes you five minutes to read every sentence, <laughs> which is the personality type I fall into, which is why I really actually dislike this book. But I can see how many people would like this book and the reason why it was nominated for so many awards. So that's my two cents. Yeah. Read it. You probably won't like it. Though. Make up your own damn <laughs> minds. <laughs> All right, John, go for it. Tell us your best thing we're oh, you guys you guys ticked off a lot of the same stuff that i i really liked about the book a lot of the psychological um the a lot of the social aspects and the commentaries and the infinite forking uh when you're com- be completely digital oh, i loved all that stuff so much um but i think that i'll try to expand and say that one of the things i really liked about the book was just you know some of the in-depth tech that came out in the book like his mm. sci- his science descriptions with the um the the circus uh the the spacecraft they took out to the, the to the beacon initially with the solar sails and the lasers and they got to have a separate sail to decelerate that they then you know it's it's partially usable because you have to release the sail and it degrades over time oh i loved all that stuff that was such a great oh was such a great part of the book yeah right um, down your alley yeah it's right down my alley oh i love when he <laughs> gets in the nitty-gritty details about uh spacecraft and and science and tech so i really liked all that part I think that the part that I disliked about the book the most was that I hated the characters. And I hated <laughs> all the characters. And not because they were despicable people. I actually disliked them on like a more like deep psychological reader level because the the characters always knew what to do and they were they felt not surprised by anything and i really disliked that i was maybe that was intentional to the author maybe the author can chime in and send send me send me a text <laughs> or send me a message personally cuz i'd like to know but like it just i they were so impersonal i couldn't relate to any of them because they were surprised by nothing it was like challenge comes up oh i know the solution oh even this is a problem even Ugh. twist at the end where they get yeah. totally screwed by the cat? You're like, that doesn't count? <laughs> well, not... They kind of, like, they already suspected that there was a, th- there was a thing. And even <laughs> the, and when they asked him afterward, did you think that that's what happened, Manfred? Yes, I knew that was what's going to happen. That's the way it always had to go. <laughs> Why? What? Oh, man. Yeah, it was, it was annoying. It was annoying that all the characters knew everything. I didn't know anything. Here, here's the second twist they were all hyper intelligent ais none of them were human to begin oh what a twist twist of twists 
<laughs> All right, Charlie, bring us home. All right, so, like, there's, you know, back to what Vincent was saying, it's like, I feel like there's, like, two real types of sci-fi novels, one of which is basically just borderline adventure novel, like, might as well be fantasy, but space! And, like, I think a lot of our favorite novels have been that. But I think some of the most effective sci-fi is where you just take, like, a really simple conceit and expand upon it. And I felt like this book was the, like, okay, if you take kind of where media is going and you take Moore's Law and extend it to the point of where, what if we could turn literally all of the matter in the solar system into pure computer bits to, like, the most physical extreme? Like, what crazy crap would happen? And from that point, like, I feel like the density of the language was justified and kind of promoting like things are yeah i mean the title of the book is accelerando that like everything's accelerating so fast mm -hmm. and i can't imagine the research the author did because yeah some of it sounds like n nonsense but i recognized enough of it like dyson spheres and whatnot to be like okay a lot oh, of this is actually there. grounded in science yeah. theory and that sort of stuff and even like matryoshka brains i was like is that a real term or is that just based because matryoshkas are like those russian stacking dolls like dolls and dolls and dolls i was like okay even if that's not, like, a real science term, like, that's a real clever way to name it so that you inherently understand it immediately. Right. So, like, I actually found the density of the language. It's like, okay, I could read over the stuff that's, like, clearly tangential to the plot, but pick up pretty quickly a lot of the key details just from the name. Like, I'm sure that's, you know, if you can't read it and pick it up in five minutes, it might be difficult to get through it. <laughs> 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 Shots fired. <laughs> Deep cut. Deep cut. But, uh, but I do have to agree with John where at least until like the later parts of the book, I kind of hated how it seemed like all of the main characters were so on top of all this supremely quick advancements. Like I actually found it really satisfying by the end where it's like, oh, pretty much everyone is screwed because the computers are so far advanced to the point of where they don't even care about the people. They're just replicating people for no reason. It's because they're mm. like doing research and they're like, what are we going to do with this person we made up? Might as well send them off to Saturn. <laughs> so like the fact that like their only option is to like hide in space because the computers are so like in their own self-absorbed worlds. Yeah. That like science actually kind of destroys humanity except for this small little enclave. Like I thought, that kind of justified the, like, everyone's so self-assured throughout the novel otherwise. Mm. But, uh, yeah, cat twist at the end was stupid, but besides that, <laughs> and, like, you know, and my main comment is, this is clearly not for everybody. Charlie's like, anti summer this episode. If this all sounds <laughs> super cool, like, go read it, but if you're like, I don't know, probably not. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right, well, I think that's pretty much all the time we have for this episode. Uh, so if you have any feedback or suggestions on books we should read and discuss, hopefully that have squirrels in them just to, to, to entertain Charlie, uh, <laughs> you could reach us at subplotofcoursepodcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at, at subplotpodcast. And for October, our last episode of the season, uh, we're going to be reading Ancillary Justice by Anne, Anne Leckie, published in 2013. Say goodbye, oh. everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Just goodbye, FYI. adoring fans. FYI, our next episode is going to be Accelerando again because I think we're going to have another recording. <laughs> be prepared. Spoilers.